Barnes Noble Union Square, please give a warm welcome to Lauren Groff and Mua Messer. I'm Mua Messer, I'm the producer and host of Port Over, and we are taping live tonight with Lauren Groff. Thank you so much for joining us. And I haven't seen you in, I mean, Zoom doesn't really count. Like, we it haven't doesn't. actually seen each other in person I know. for a minute. Maybe uh, six years? Wow. Like I know, I know, it's been a long time. So, a million years ago, we met in Florida mm -hmm. at an event that I think neither of us has been back to. I don't even remember. <laughs> I don't even remember the name yeah. of it. But I knew Lauren's work. I mean, obviously, I'd been reading her since Monsters of Templeton, and I... Which, was this for Arcadia? I have no idea. Okay, so yeah. we don't even know. No, but. you're the only thing I retains from that whole uh, experience. So. <laughs> Which is nice to know. Thank I you know. for that. <laughs> but watching Lauren's career has been really amazing. And I am a huge, huge fan of what she's been doing lately. And I have to say, and I know I said this to you when we talked about Matrix, which was a B&N book club pick, you made me care about 12th century nuns. And I still really care about those 12th century nuns, and I'm still desperate to ride a horse into someone's house. Oh, you can. Uh -huh. you, I'm you gonna, can. I am going to find a way okay, to make this good. happen. But now we've got The Vaster Wilds, and it's been out for a week, so some of you may have read it, some of you may have not. I like to stay away from spoilers, though. Okay. Good. Because there's also a lot in this book that... I've read it twice now, because I have the luxury sometimes of doing these things. And there's so much beauty in this book. There's also some stuff that you do with story and some surprises that we get that I would like to not ruin okay. for folks who are sitting in front of us, but also for the folks who will be listening when we get this episode up, which will be soon. I was doing a tiny bit of research before we sat down. And the thing that made me laugh out loud, and if you work in my office, I'm so sorry because I was barking when I was laughing. You wrote a first draft of The Faster Wilds in iambic pentameter. It wasn't the first draft. It okay, was okay, draft. you wrote a yes. draft yes. Yes. of this novel in iambic pentameter, <laughs> and we have to talk about this before we go any further. Okay, okay. so the way that I work, because I have OCD, I need to mm -hmm. not work on a computer. I need to okay. write longhand because it allows me to move on from one thing to the next. Otherwise, I would be staring at the same paragraph for you know, three months and never mm -hmm. write anything. Mm -hmm. And I write in fast, ugly, unbelievably stupid drafts. And I do it on purpose to make right. them flawed and messy and horrifically bad so that mm -hmm. uh, I can move from one to the next to build up the foundations of the story, the characters, the way that they are off the page, right? All of these things. And so at one point, I th it was like halfway in, I knew basically the story. I was still working out some things, right. but I was so frustrated. I could not get this story. So I decided I'm just going to take like a month and do the dumbest possible thing I could, which is write it in iambic pentameter, to try to get like the, the rhythms and try to actually... So form is amazing right. because form allows you to um, think of things that you wouldn't otherwise think of, right? I, mm -hmm. I began as a poet, a very bad poet, but I love form for, for coaxing out of your subconscious the things that have been so buried, right? right. And, and uh, uh, allowing suggestions to bloom in un mm -hmm. unexpected ways. So that's why I did that, knowing full on, like w with all my first drafts, that I wasn't even going to try to read it again. Right. Yes. So it was bad. That's okay if it's bad. I yeah. just like the idea... <laughs> Of sitting, because you've also said, I'm certainly, I know I'm not the first person to ask this, but you've also mentioned that you weren't really a fan of historical fiction mm -hmm. before you started writing it. And, you know, I sort of feel like we're in this moment in books, and I've been doing this book thing for a while, but we're in this moment where you're kind of, people are very comfortable and happy hanging out in their genre. Mm -hmm. Like, they have their thing, they're waving their flag. I am really, really Catholic in my reading taste. Like, I read wildly, right. broadly. me too. And... Sometimes that's a great idea, and sometimes I'm like, uh-huh. I would like to go back to the thing with the language. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, language is my thing, right? Mm -hmm. But here you are. You've written two historical novels back-to-back, -back, mm -hmm. 12th century, 17th century. You have revised your attitude about historical fiction in general. <laughs> and I want to know what you get from hanging out centuries ago. Oh, I get so much. Mm -hmm. right? So I think a lot of um, these two books in particular, uh, I, you know, I was having, I guess, 
I was stuck in multiple tsunamis of dread mm-hmm. when the contemporary world was so large and so much. And you probably might have a different experience, but uh, during the Trump presidency, it was just like I felt like I was drowning, right? right. I just could not get enough air. And I did not want to live in the contemporary world at all, right? I had a really hard time living there. And I didn't want to write about cell phones, which I find mind-numbingly stupid, right? Or, you know, Netflix or anything that I feel like I would have felt obligated to put right. into books like this. So and that's one thing. But another thing, too, is I do think it's a moral imperative of an artist to talk about the urgencies of the moment, Right. But you can do that in historical fiction. Mm-hmm. I think my, my preconception of historical fiction, which I carried from grad school, is that it's a very conservative form, right. which only is looking backwards and mm-hmm. is only cathartic. But actually, you can talk, you can slide your way into talking about right. urgencies of the now through historical fiction in ways that possibly are even more difficult doing in a contemporary book. You know, I found myself talking about the things that are, are the most urgent to me, mm-hmm. uh, just in, with this different lens. One of the things I really love too with both Vaster Wilds and Matrix is the way you play with time and the way you use time as markers. Mm. The first time I read Vaster Wilds, I flew through it. I may have actually canceled dinner on someone. And oh. if you're in my life, you know I do this. Like occasionally I will cancel dinner on someone so I can finish reading <laughs> And my better half knows that he, sometimes he just rolls his eyes, but whatever. He is a book widower. But marking time with language. The Vaster Wilds takes place in about, what, two weeks? And then there's, there's mm-hmm. a piece that happened. But the bulk of what we're reading... Mm-hmm. It's kind of two weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's both prolapsis and analepsis. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it goes backwards right, and right, forwards right, right, as right. well, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very short period of time. No. But it's not only... So time is so glorious mm-hmm. in writing fiction mm-hmm. because that's our material. Yeah. Fiction writer's material is time and character through word, right? right. And, and community individualism through word. So the beautiful thing about writing, particularly in the third person too with time, is that even though it is a very short window, right. I'm coming in and out with a godlike voice sort of vertically as mm-hmm. well. So yep. it's horizontal and vertical at the same time. Yep. yep. Horizontal and vertical, backwards, forwards. Yep. We never really get a handle on the girl's name. We know she's adolescent. Mm -hmm. Right. Purchased at the age of four, at one point a human foot warmer for the (laughs) mistress of the house, which was a detail I'm not sure I'm ever going to forget. (laughs) And then we end up in Jamestown, which is its own kind of mythology. And I want to play with the idea of mythology for a second because, you know, Arcadia, obviously, utopia. Mm -hmm. Fates and Furies, a nod to mythology. Mm -hmm. And we've got this pervasive mythology of not just the American West, but the idea of wilderness Mm -hmm. in America. The frontier. The frontier, exactly. And you walked into this novel with a very deliberate ambition, (laughs) which is to challenge captivity narratives, which are something I've never particularly liked. And I was was a history student, um, not an English major. And um, captivity narratives always made me itch. Mm Mm-hmm. Propaganda does not belong only to the modern age, Mm-mm. right? Like, if you've read a captivity narrative, they probably make your toes curl or your teeth itch, whatever metaphor you want. But you decided you were going to take this head on and turn it inside out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when did you start playing with this idea? When did Because you were writing this at the same time you were writing Matrix. Yeah, oh, well, I started this before Matrix. Oh, okay. And then it, yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a notebook that I just found again uh, where I was taking notes in 2016 for this book. So mm-hmm. uh, it's been a long, slow gestation. Captivity narratives were in this book from the beginning just yep. because I've, I've always been uncomfortable with them and mm-hmm. at the same time really attracted to them. I mean, right. Mary Rawlinson's story is a rip-roaring tale and it's incredibly well-written and she's the first living female American writer published in American history. So she's very important, actually. But right, her the way that the story was used was used for, for purposes to justify genocide, Christian spread across mm-hmm. this country. So it's really complicated. That was one aspect. And the other aspect is also, I'm from Cooperstown, New York. Right. Uh, and, you know, the patron literary saint of Cooperstown is James Fenimore Cooper mm-hmm. because his father built the town 
and he's everywhere. Like all of the restaurants have Pathfinder names and <laughs> like leather stocking names. And he was the only sort of the the literary light that I grew up with. I mean, I could go and sit on like the bronze lap in mm-hmm. uh, the statue of him. I have always been interested in the frontier narrative as a basically the ur mythology for America in some ways. I mean, captivity narratives I think were the the first taste of it. James Fenimore took Cooper then took this idea and turned it into Natty Bumpo, the leather stocking. Mm-hmm. This this lone cowboy, uh, laconic, uh, doesn't like other individuals, believes himself to be alone without a community and communion with other people. All of the tropes that have filtered through time to spaghetti westerns, to mm-hmm. Cormac McCarthy, right? To sort of build a, a national narrative, right. which I find a very poisonous, a toxic na- national narrative from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. So that was something that I was really interested in from day one. And then you pin it, you pin your story, your version of the story, on an illiterate teenage girl. Right. Who, in this time mm-hmm. in, of predestination, right. was never going to go to heaven because right. she's a girl and poor, and who knows where she came from. Yeah, This novel is so wonderfully subversive in so many ways. <laughs> I want to go back to morals, though, for a second. You mentioned this, that the novelist has a moral obligation, right, mm-hmm. to center us in our world. And Hernan Diaz, who's a writer you love, mm-hmm. and a writer I love, if you haven't read Trust, if you haven't read In the Distance, please do yourself a favor and read both of those sooner rather than later. He talks about you as having a really steady set of ethics when you're working. And I'm wondering, is there a difference between morality and ethics? I'm the wrong person to ask. I don't know. Is there? You, I don't you know. The, yeah. Part of why I'm yeah. asking is I feel like you have this very sort of steady sense of where the story is going, uh-huh. but that you don't want to let us off the hook. I mean, some not great things happen in mm. this book, right? Like, I mean, there's some really rough bits that happen to our girl, but you and I were talking about this before we came out on stage, and there are people who are insisting that this book is really dark, and I laughed when you told me that, because I was just like, I don't think we read the same book. Yeah. There are elements, yes, where the story gets difficult and complicated and uncomfortable, but in the grand scheme of things, it feels very hopeful, mm-hmm. it feels, I don't know if mystical is the word I want, but there's, there's a connection to something that is bigger than our girl without capital G God happening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Can we just talk about that? Because I do sure. think somehow morals and ethics are wrapped up into this. And I never took the philosophy classes that other people took in undergrad. But I did, I, but it was 25 years ago. Yeah, okay. I don't, like, I don't remember but, yesterday. So. Um, well, okay, there's that. <laughs> but I do feel like it all is of a piece, this mm-hmm. balance, right? Like mm-hmm. Marilyn Robinson does this too mm-hmm. in Gilead, mm-hmm. where you know there's this sort of humming spirituality isn't the word that I want, though. Mm-hmm. That's, there is a, a connection to the universe that you never lose sight of. Yeah, well, I mean, that is the crux of this book. Okay. And I'm so happy that you're a reader that sees the, the joy and the mm-hmm. sort of the passion and the ecstasy in it as well, because that is something that is, uh, ties back to, to Matrix in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my medieval mystics yeah, and, yeah. and this girl, are, she, they're having sometimes similar experiences with the, the material body suffering, but the yeah. soul opening, blooming toward heaven, right? Mm-hmm. It was really important to me that this book be on an anagogical plane, right? Maybe that's what okay. you're hinting at with the, the question about morality, is that there's always this upward motion happening in this particular book, and I'm trying to do it on purpose, right? right? I'm, this is, this is the, the center of the book. Mm-hmm. So... We're in an American landscape that I think a lot of us have not necessarily been able to experience because we've cut down the trees, we've built left and right, we have, in fact, paved paradise and put up a parking lot. And I'm so (laughs) sorry I did that to you, but I had to do that. Um, But all all of these things, right? All of these things that we've done to change this landscape and to separate ourselves, right, Mm -hmm. from this landscape... And yet you give us, what, 253 very tightly written pages. <laughs> but I want to talk about nature, and I want to talk about sort of the legacy of writers mm-hmm. who come 
at Nature Writing. Not necessarily. I mean, William Bartram certainly shows up in Florida in oh, some yeah. earlier work, and there are so many nods to very specifically nature writers, and I just mm-hmm. I want to set you up. To oh, be good. Able to <laughs> talk about that Emerson quote. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was deeply excited mm-hmm. about the um, transcendentalists when I was writing this book, mm-hmm. and I think that you can you can feel the roots of their passionate engagement with the natural world. I would hope in this book, mm-hmm. um, there's a quote from Emerson that's actually talking about the things, and I you know I wrote it in this little book in my terrible handwriting, so I hope I can read it now. But when Emerson, it's in this this wonderful essay called Nature, he says. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite spaces, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. And this is something that was sort of thrumming in my mind as I was trying Mm -hmm. to write this book. Of course, I also read Thoreau deeply uh, over the course of writing this book as well, too. There's something about the deep American ecstatics that I love so profoundly, Mm -hmm. right? The the Walt Whitmans of the world, the Herman Melvilles of the world, the Emily Dickinsons, the, the people who sort of shine with this almost unworldly enthusiasm um, and and love. And those are the people that I, I go back to over and over and over again, mm-hmm. I hope in my work, but also just in my reading, right? right. I really, I, you know, it's, there's nothing like being stuck in a cabin during the pandemic with your two children and then coming across the row again, right? I started to have mm-hmm. more faith in humanity mm-hmm. after touching his extraordinary intellect. You told Esquire that this book, though, is a self-portrait. It's closer to you and a little more revealing than any of the other books. And I do... I'm not going to let you off the hook here for a second. I do, I do want to go there, because usually you and I just stick to the language and everything yeah. else. But that felt like a really interesting comment to me. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to... Okay. Poke you a little bit on yeah. that. I'm not talking about my experience doing Outward Bounds here, although I do have to say <laughs> that, that was one of the, the experiences that went into right. this book. Yeah. When I was a teenager, this is like really a long time ago, I went on this Outward Bound trip to Hurricane Island in Maine. And it was great. It was also one of these trips that was sponsored by the local philanthropist. So half of the kids were like, brown nosers like me who had to write like a 500 word <laughs> essay to get on these boats. And the other half were like borderline, right? Like borderline kids who were great. Um, but I think the idea was that the exposure to the like to the brown nosers would make the other people, mm-hmm. you know, come into line. There's this one moment where I woke up one of the uh, these lovely kids um, for the midnight watch, mm-hmm. and he came up swinging and just clocked me. Right? It was like I had like a black eye for half of it. But there was this one night. On my solo, which was, I think, three days, two nights, I chose not to eat any food. So I was like in a a fasting fugue and I had spent the day trying to sunbathe in Maine. Uh, So like the, like it was, I was. I'm sorry, what month was this? It was, was, I don't even, like June. It was very cold. Um, And lobster men kept going by and like shouting things at me, (laughs) which I didn't quite hear right over the engines. But uh, this one night. The thunders, like yeah, a storm yeah. came yeah. up. It was like, you know, you know, it was horrible. And there's lightning across the right. ocean. And I was watching the clouds pour in. And I was scared um, just because I was all alone. And I had this moment where I was like wedged between these rocks with the tarp flapping on top mm-hmm. of me in the strong wind and the rain coming down. And I was like, I'm going to die, but it's so beautiful, right? <laughs> like, this is incredible. So that was one of these moments that came into the book. But that, that's not what I meant. Um, right. About the the autobiography. I still love that nature. story. Thank but. you, thank you. I made it. I lived. I, yes, you know, lucky for us. I survived. But I am having a moment of you were trying to sunbathe in Maine in June, and I'm just laughing at our teenage Naked selves too. Yeah, I, you know, that's my I'm just German laughing, aspect, yeah. laughing at our teenage yeah. selves. We knew nothing. Oh my God, no. It it's was, amazing that we made it. It was this also long. called Mosquito Island, so I was being like, uh, I've spent by summers in Maine. I, yeah, mm, black flies, all yeah. of that. It was really I, fun. And also, the water really never gets beyond say 55 degrees. <laughs> At most, yeah. <laughs> so th- this book is m- the most personal because it is mm-hmm. what I feel about the world itself, right. right? I think there are things in this book that took me 
to until now, writing mm-hmm. almost every single day of my life from the time mm-hmm. that I was 19 until now, to be able to have the courage to face up to. Like and what? I, the theology of the book, right? right? The, the, right. The, the deep spiritual mm-hmm. stuff. I think that's scary, especially in our society. I, you know, yep. And how I am running away from religion, mm-hmm. an interpretation of God, and toward a larger, less, um, interpretive idea of God or the grand eternal mysteries, right? The the pulsing underlying all things. I love the idea that Matrix and Vaster Wilds sit so closely together and you've mm-hmm. talked about them. Is You're still doing this trilogy thing. Right? <laughs> it's not a trilogy. Or a triptych. <laughs> or, 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 or experiment in... I just, I, But I like the idea of the two of them sitting in conversation. Yes. And a little bit in opposition. Oh, yes. As well. Oh, massively, yes. But the idea that you can sort of take your time and use character and language and also the sheer physicality mm. of these women. This teenage, this tiny teenager, well, she's probably tall. No, she's tiny. She's not, she's tiny? Yeah, she's okay. very small. All right, so she's tiny, but Marie is not. No. We know that. But, but just the physical demands that they're placing on their bodies through the course of these books, like you don't really want to sit down and read quietly, right? Like this is the kind of thing where it's just moving and moving and moving and, and it never slows down. So for you, and you've said before that you need to see your characters before you really, mm-hmm. really get them. Mm-hmm. So can we talk about the creation of the girl sort of in mm-hmm. relation? Because Marie, obviously, we meet her when she's 17, but then we get a much broader mm-hmm. span mm-hmm. of her experience. Yeah, I mean, Marie from Matrix uh, has so much of Hildegard von Bingen in okay. her, even down to the representations okay. of Hildegard as in um, her own personal seal as uh, three times taller than the nuns around her, which mm-hmm. I found hilarious and actually gave that to Marie <laughs> in my book, like actual physically. So this girl, I, she came out of the situation, right? right. So, so she just started thrumming alive as I was building what was happening and sort of the episodes that were happening in this book and the sort of the, the, the deeper resonance of the book. And I had to make a character who was able to be nimble and hyper intelligent and very thoughtful, very resourceful. And who in the beginning of the book, because she's so young and she was built in this um, incredibly tight society mm-hmm. and she has never been given time or leisure to think Uh, She has so much received wisdom that she has to break out of over the course of the book, right? That's Mm -hmm. this is one of the narrative through lines of the book is her her losing these ideas like so many snakeskins, right? Mm -hmm. They're just sort of falling behind her as she runs through the woods. It's a little bit like you're writing about the end of the world again, right? Ish. I mean. This seems to be something that you bounce back. And I'm not necessarily saying the literal end of the world, but there are some stories in Florida, certainly, where you break up with your boyfriend and you lose your teaching stipend and suddenly you're living I do, in your I car. Do. Not you specifically, <laughs> but worlds end really quickly. Mm. Or, you know, Arcadia, certainly, mm-hmm. or Fates and Furies. I mean... Jamestown is a failed experiment. Well, it ended up surviving the the starving time. I mean, it... Which still blows yeah, my mind, yeah. but in the grand scheme, like, it's not what the people who planned it thought it would be. The experience of the thing is not lined up with sort of what the design was. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's a little bit of a metaphor for writing a book, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess. A little bit, kind of, sort of. Uh, yeah, well, no. All right. <laughs> I'm going to rephrase that. <laughs> I'm going to rework I think that you question. Come as close as possible to your platonic ideal, right? Okay. And I think that's not possible in utopian experiments mm-hmm. because the nature of utopia is that it holds its own seeds of destruction. Right? Okay. I mean, even in the word itself, right? So Thomas More, mm-hmm. Utopos, Utopos, right? No place, every place. It's impossible to actually. A book two cannot be perfect. Yep. But you can bring it as close as possible to your vision. I feel like as a reader, though, I've experienced perfect books. Oh. 
perfect for you at that time. Yes. Right? Because that's yes. the all, that's the other thing too. The reader brings 50% of mm-hmm. the book to the book, right? Everything that happens happens only because the reader is interpreting it. Like mm-hmm. a like a musician playing music. It doesn't exist. Right, without the reader. There are the things that age well <laughs> on my shelf, and then there are the things where I'm like, wow, that's mm-hmm. still actually there. Isn't that great? I think it's yeah. beautiful. It is gorgeous, but I want to talk about what you go back to, because I know you and I in the past, we've spoken about Don Quixote. Mm-hmm. We have spoken about Middlemarch, which I still keep attempting, because I know you love this book, and I even bought a copy that has French flaps, and it's still not helping. It's still on the pile. I will just own that. But... Just plow through it. I'm, I, I okay. will. I promise I will. But I do want to talk about some of the other influence. I mean, you've mm-hmm. spoken about Robinson Crusoe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a little bit of Pilgrim's Progress. Oh, yeah. Yes. What I didn't else? think about that, but absolutely. Yeah. What, yeah. Else are we, what else are we thinking about in terms of influences? I mean, the transcendentalists, obviously, but let's go back to fiction for a second. Yeah, just spinning back a little bit for like two minutes. Yeah. Uh, I do have a deeply eschatological imagination. I am really deeply into the end times. <laughs> and that's because I was a fervent child who okay. read the Bible. And okay. Revelation is one of the greatest parts of the Bible, for, okay. especially for an imaginative young child. It's so bonkers. Like you, you can read it. I don't it. disagree. I, okay, yeah. But I came to it as an adult because... Unitarian. I mean, oh, I yeah, just, right. I, yeah. you have to chase some stuff later. <laughs> That's really all comes down to. Yeah, also, I mean, we are living in the Anthropocene, yeah. right? And uh, I think often thinking about stories of the end are right. a way to um, help us deal with the anxieties of the actual end. Mm-hmm. I mean, all lives end, right? All lives yeah. are utopian experiments. Therefore, maybe we should prepare for it through narrative. But, okay, some of the other influences in this book mm-hmm. uh, that we haven't already discussed uh, it's complicated. Cormac McCarthy mm-hmm. is one, for instance, right? Because he's a frontier novelist, yep. but he's a frontier novelist who is hugely and gorgeously aware of his own inability to mm-hmm. write living women, right? It's so, like he wrote a lot he of knew. dead ones, but he he did. He knew. He understood. Nope. And so he created yep. this alternate mythology of hyper, hyper-masculine West in which everything was incredibly violent and there was no light. And the only joy was the joy of the natural world and of the language, right? So so he is in this book. Actually, I have a, one moment in the book that's an homage to something that's in the road. And I know oh. you know what it is, but um, yeah. 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 Sorry. I did it because The Road was so powerful when I read it. I mm-hmm. read it, I would not recommend this. I read, this, I read it when I was pregnant. Oh, dude. Um, with my first son. And like, ever an incredibly anxious human yeah. to begin with, with this unknown, like, possible disaster growing day by day inside of you and the end of the world outside the windows. That was, it really sent me off the deep end. I was really a mess. Until the baby came, and then it was a worse mess, right? And it never got better. It just kept going. <laughs> Except he's kind of a happy teenager now. Oh, he's so, magnificent. I mean... <laughs> oh, my God. Well, right, the reality of the person actually, yeah. like, offsets a lot right. of the anxiety right, of the right. self. Yeah. yeah. Cormac seems not like a stretch. At all. Okay, are we looking for stretch influences? Because this is exciting. I don't I know. I kind of am, just a okay. tiny bit, because I know how widely you read, and I know how much you read. Yeah. I think you actually read more than I do a year, which... Well, I have no other job, and you do, so that's the difference. Yeah, but I read pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean... I... Okay. I also anyway. listen to audiobooks. That's part yeah, of my... Well, like, no, yeah. audio does... Actually, a good audiobook oh, is a best. treat. Yeah, oh, yeah, it really is a treat. Oh, my goodness. Um, and yeah. sometimes when I'm rereading, when I'm prepping for a show, I will absolutely mm-hmm. like run through the audio. But for a first experience, I kind of do want... I need paper. I kind of really mm-hmm. like paper and mm-hmm. being able to write all over my books and dog ear them and oh, destroy I them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm one of those people. I just want to get into the thing and make all of my notes. I like the object. I tried to keep it unsullied. I respect. Okay. I can't do it. I can't. I just, I can't do it. It's, it's wild. I okay. cannot, cannot right. do it. I know, for instance, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge oh, yeah, for were Mrs. part of Fates and Furies. And those are two books that I love that people don't quite know the way they used to. They so really should. This is, this yeah. is my kind of plea for us to sort of maybe bring up some stuff that folks have not maybe thought about. 
I mean, who has read Robinson Crusoe recently? I mean, like, it, it's great. It's great, right? Truly, tremendously okay. great. Oh, so, oh, God, Miwa. Like, if you give me this, like, question two days ago, I could have come up with a really good list no, for you. That's okay. I'll keep thinking. And that's then fair. I'll tell you I know. At the end. And you know what? That's totally fair. <laughs> you know, I'm always going to try. But, you know, for instance, yesterday I was talking to uh, Paul Murray, who wrote The Beasting, and Samuel Beckett comes into the conversation waiting for Godot. Love Samuel Beckett. As I Lay Dying by Faulkner, and Laurie Moore, who will run the Frog Hospital. Okay. And they all sort of factor into this. 700 page novel and I never would have expected that combination but it makes perfect sense to yeah. me and I know you're a huge fan of Laurie Moore though. Oh, I'm a huge, huge fan of Laurie yeah, Moore yeah yeah wait Frog Hospital wasn't the book that blew your mind open though before you no, started studying no it was anagrams on... okay yeah okay. and Birds of America too okay. yeah was... and then you started studying with Laurie I did study and with her and then you wrote this amazing introduction to the collected stories which I'm going to make a plea too if you're a Laurie Moore person Read yes. Lauren's introduction to oh, the collected no. stories. Read <laughs> the collected great. stories. Read the collected stories too, but yeah. just this sort of circular motion, right? This mm. coming back to your teacher. I can't believe she let me write it. Uh, I know, I'm right? Glad she did, that but really also kind of you her. edited the O Henry, the current O Henry I did. anthology. Yeah, like all of these amazing moments that we can string together, right? <sighs> Out of words and moments and time. Like, it's all just folding back on itself. Yeah. Like, what haven't you done yet that you really want to do? Oh, there's so much. I know. Right? But so, um, well, this third part of the triptych, I'd really mm-hmm. like to nail, right? Like, I've written so many drafts. I just I haven't found the form yet, but it'll come. It'll come. Mm-hmm. It'll come. Maybe not, but it'll come. And then, uh, you know, I've got, like, three other books sort of on, right now, very low simmer because I'm on book tour, and I mm-hmm. genuinely cannot even watch anything at night because yeah. I'm an introvert and being in with humans is really hard oh god there's so much i want Mm -hmm. yeah i I just want to keep working right i just want to keep making stories and um reading books what about poetry oh my god i love poetry (laughs) i know you love poetry but would you ever possibly start writing it for our consumption but for our consumption oh i know you write poetry i know I'm talking about sharing it with those of us who do not share an office with you. <laughs> oh, so you're looking for a scoop. And I, uh, I have a little bit of a scoop for you, which is yeah. I've been writing poetry. Okay. And I've been publishing some of it, but not under my own name. Oh. I'm really embarrassed okay. about okay. it. Because it's right. not that good. If um, it's not that good, why is it being published? That's a very good question, which you'd have to take up with the journal uh, hmm. um, editors. Okay. They don't know it's me, I think. I'm pretty positive about this. That's hysterical. Yeah. I love that story. Yeah, but I absolutely <laughs> love that story. And if I had more time, I would go hunting for it. I am leaving that to the audience. You, you, you will not be able to find it. <laughs> oh, no. I, I do not it's doubt the... that I won't be able to find it. I, I know when I'm... I'm sort of beaten. But I do want to talk about language because I know that poetry has been a thing for you. And I've also been reading you... There is not a single one of your books I have not read, lady. But I want to talk about language and the structure of language, and I'm holding a question in my hand from one of you. Thank you for this. But flipping between sort of what someone might consider more traditional language Mm -hmm. for a historical novel. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about you and Hilary Mantel, too, A Place of Greater Safety. Okay, so I'm the contrarian. I know. Hilary Mantel. Yes, Wolf Hall is great. The Wolf Hall books are really good, but Incredible. don't miss A Place of Greater Safety, which is her French Revolution novel. Yes. And it was early in her career. It's one of her favorite books, actually. And I really Was it like, her first book? It might have been. I think it might actually, have been, it her, been her debut. It's which, unbelievably good. Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous book. But she does the same thing with language as she does in Wolf Hall, where you've got the immediacy of sort of our cadence, our vocabulary, our... There are no these and thous, and no. you do a very similar thing, which I thank you for doing that. But also, <laughs> can we talk about that decision to sort of keep one foot in the here and now and one foot in the historical record? Well, it's incredibly tricky, right? Mm-hmm. Because you want to hint at Elizabethan language without yep. necessarily putting it into Elizabethan language because mm-hmm. it's it's not impenetrable for people who have studied right. Shakespeare or other writers of the time. It is generally pretty impenetrable unless you have a teacher teaching you. My 15-year-old has been trying to read 
some like one of the Shakespeare plays for high school, and I have to sit down with him every night and explain things to him. Right, it's really difficult. Right, right. right. So you don't want to, and you don't want to devolve into pastiche, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want to yep. say, but you do want to make things very strange or or get sort of the rhythms and get the um the I guess the skeleton of the language, right? Yep. The the some of the elements of the structure and language. So. It's a it's a really fine balancing act. When for me, it's at the very end when I actually pay attention to the language because right. it's the great glory and joy of my life, um, and I put it off like a true Calvinist until um, the very end. And at that point, so you're listening, so you're you're yeah. training your deep ear right. to hear sort of the the way that um, you're hitting the contemporary and the past in the middle, mm-hmm. so, somewhere in the middle. So, so you can allow the everyday reader in because mm-hmm. I, I don't want to make inaccessible books, right? I want my mother-in-law's book club to read yep. my books, right? I mean, I really do. Hey, we picked Matrix for the BNN book club, so I, know, I understand I'm exactly so what we're talking and about. And you made here. so many people angry. Thank you so much for that. I love forcing like people to read about things that they're not excited about reading. It's very thrilling. But I still think about the way you mark time matrix. You know, we've got that point where Marie gets to the Abbey and everyone's in a rather bad spot and the Abbey is not working and everything. Yeah. And then suddenly we go and, you know, trees are blooming and there are 60 sheep. And mm. then we go from 12 nuns to... Sud- you do the simple sentences, right? Yeah. Like it's, and it's just you drop in this little marker. Uh-huh. And I feel like you're doing that throughout vast or wild <gasps> oh, as we, well. I found um, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, something that, uh, okay. like in the deep d- DNA yeah, yeah, of this yeah. book, yeah, yeah. Uh, I also read, this is going to sound so bonkers, but I read all of um, A la recherche de temps perdu while I was writing this book, right? Wait, so you finally got, rid- got through all of Proust? I got through all of Proust. Okay. But here's the thing that okay. I, I took from Proust, okay. which is so exciting to me. Okay. The way that he can fold time, yeah. right? This is a book about time and the Mm -hmm. most gorgeous way and he does this by the use of ellipsis so Mm -hmm. within one sentence he's able to skip a whole entire generation sometimes he Mm -hmm. goes from one place to another sometimes it's years sometimes it's you know 10 years but he does it so profoundly well and he also you know he he uses every single aspect of of time management you possibly can Mm -hmm. in this book so i learned a great deal about how to deal with time from this massive two million word like set of books that sit on my shelf mm-hmm. in, like, with, so dauntingly right I love it very much you also learn how the long sentence can do mm-hmm. many many things that a series of short sentences cannot yep. do right you you learn how to use clauses mm-hmm. uh, in the most effective and interesting way I was working on this book a lot when I had this fellowship at um, Radcliffe mm-hmm. Institute for Advanced Studies and one of the classes I took was the philosophy of A la recherche de temps perdu. So I was taking a philosophy class that was talking a lot about Schopenhauer and all these other yeah, incredible yeah. philosophers while also simultaneously rereading this incredible book. Mm-hmm. It was the greatest, greatest class. And I was the old lady sitting in the back because I was surrounded by these young Harvard students who... I don't know if they read the book. I would doubt it. Mm-hmm. Um, but they definitely read the passages that mm-hmm. the, the professor was talking about. I was like the eager beaver, like really excited. Well, I can tell because I'm looking at your face as you're telling yeah. me this story. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the beauty of it, right? Like you're pulling from all of these different places. Mm-hmm. You've created an entire world that I had not experienced prior to reading The Vaster Wilds. Mm-hmm. How many of you have had a chance to actually read the book so far? Okay. Thank so you. you kind of know what I'm yeah. talking about. The rest of you will discover when you read it that the scale of the place mm-hmm. when we're in the wilderness, mm-hmm. the claustrophobia of what she left behind mm-hmm. in England, mm-hmm. it's really extraordinary what you've done. And no, I have not read Robinson Crusoe recently, but I've been thinking about it a lot because also I remember reading Faux, yeah. that J.M. Coetzee novel a million years i don't even yeah. know i should know this but i don't know if it's still in print it is okay yeah all right i read it not that long ago too but i mean i remember sort of having my socks knocked off when i read that mm-hmm. because i hadn't like that was the first sort of playing around with this idea of crusoe and i knew that was a piece of vaster mm-hmm. wild mm-hmm. but to hold a book in your hands and be able to read a story where you have not 
felt this, it's very propulsive narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really not, you gallop through the pages. You really do. And it's not just me. It's because the I am. Yeah. It, yes. <laughs> it really, no, it really is. I promise you, you will discover this when you pick up the book. But also, I got really attached to the girl. Good. I oh, got good. really attached to her. And there was a moment sort of close to the end, but certainly not the end, where I almost got mad at you. Oh, yeah. No, I yeah, know. Yeah, you know, you know the do. point I'm talking about. <laughs> do you miss her? Oh, I do. Yeah. Okay. She and Bit from Arcadia yeah, yeah. are the ones that I'm really worried about. Right? Yeah, I worry about, yeah, I would worry about Bit. Uh, I, I would he did not make it through the pandemic very well. We know mm -hmm. this because the pandemic's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, could you stop doing that, please? <laughs> Every now and again, I'm like, Lauren, can you just not write I, about this for a minute? So, yeah, no, I know. I got mad at myself, too, when I was writing this book because I knew it had to happen, but it blooms into other things. It does. Right? Yes, it really, yeah. really, there's, really, really does. There's joy here. Please read it with. Uh, please be the joy readers and don't be the doom readers. Thank you. I think if you no, I, I really, if you walk into this novel with an open heart, I promise you the payoff is, the payoff is there. I absolutely promise you that. You will be shocked at how quickly this book moves. And I'm sort of thinking about it because there have been a lot of very big books recently. You cover a lot of ground. You've written in a very epic tale, very tightly. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always happen. Mm -mm. And some stories, you know, they need a little bit of room to roam, and other mm -hmm. stories don't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that you write short stories. We know you've written longer novels. We mm -hmm. know you've done lots of different... Now we know you've been sneaking poetry around in the world. Mm -hmm. Why do you write? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> This is funny. So, well, this reminds me of something that happened about six months ago. I, was, uh -huh. I had this wonderful fellowship in Berlin, yep. and I gave this long 45-minute talk about uh -huh. why I write historical fiction. And at the end, this historian, who I really like, actually, got up, and he goes, yeah, but why do you write historical fiction? <laughs> it's like, a, like a, I just told you over 45 minutes. And so my answer is, it's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, 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 yeah. It's my love, yeah. right? It's my profoundest joy. Mm -hmm. It's what um, makes me get up in the morning, other than my children, who are also great. It was my first child, right. you know, before right. they came. And, I'm, you know, I would never starve my first child to feed my other two. So it, it's the way that I can interact with the world without being overwhelmed all the time. Yeah. I, it, there's so many reasons. There's not just one. Yeah. Community, maybe? Oh, I mean, profoundly. even though you keep writing about the end of the world or the ends of different worlds, I should say, I do always walk away with a very profound sense of community. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, there's a difference between being alone and being lonely, mm -hmm. right? Vaster Wilds, for me, was a really profound reading experience. And it really... I felt so much more connected to my various pieces of my life. Good. Because the stakes felt higher than they would have if you had maybe set this in a contemporary... Mm -hmm. I think I just... I needed to be knocked out of my comfort zone. Good. Yeah. And it was really satisfying. Well, this is one of the things that I've been trying to do more recently, mm -hmm. which is make the reader complicit. Yeah, I was, very, I was books, very complicit. Right? <laughs> and maybe that we're going back a little bit to what you said about the moral stakes. Yeah. But I do think that that is a way to up the moral stakes in a yeah. book, is to make the reader complicit. I mean, part of art for me, mm -hmm. I mean, and obviously books are the starting point in art, but art for me, I like it to push me to think. Mm -hmm. There is a book for every reader, absolutely. Like Some people just want to read for entertainment, and that's great. And there's certainly plenty of entertainment in the Vaster Wilds. But for me, as a reader, I, just, I need to be pushed to think in a new direction. Mm -hmm. I need to connect with ideas that aren't mine. Mm -hmm. And then when you see stuff that matters reflected back at you, mm -hmm. it's a really excellent experience. 
And I know what my face looks like right now because one, I have a Lucy Ricardo face and when I get excited about stuff, it's really obvious. And I'm really excited about this book. I'm really excited about the girl. I'm really excited about whatever comes after this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Something will. And someone's going to figure out the poetry thing. I know someone's going to figure no out the poetry No thing. one's going to figure it out. Lauren Groff, thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. Thank you for thank being you. a great audience. You guys were great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mila. Thank you for listening. Port Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.